So, dear viewers, welcome to A Psych for Sore Minds. Today, I've got a very interesting guest, Mr. Randy Williams, who is a US private investigator and author and expert on Jack the Ripper. How are you doing today, sir? Great, thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So let's, let's get straight into it. Uh, my viewers would have heard of Jack the Ripper, but they might not necessarily know that much about him. So do you mind just giving us an overview of who he was and what he allegedly did? All right, well, the popular opinion was Jack the Ripper was one person, although in my opinion, he was actually three men being paid by a fourth. I'll explain that as we go. But the, uh, the popular story is that Jack the Ripper was one man that terrorized England uh, London, specifically in the East End, Whitechapel, to be specific, um, in the autumn of 1888, 133 years ago. And as a matter of fact, today and last night were uh, landmark dates in the case, because last night would have been the 133rd anniversary of Jack the Ripper's what was called the double event. And that was a double murder. He, he killed two different women in two different locations a half an hour apart um, after having warned the police through a letter um, that he was going to do so. And that happened uh, exactly 133 years ago last night. Today would have been the anniversary, the 133rd anniversary of the receipt of what's called the Saucy Jackie postcard, where he taunted the police basically with a postcard, um, which many serial killers, as you know, Dr. Das have done you know, in the interim, but he was probably the first to actually taunt the police using uh, the mail. So that would have arrived this morning to the Central News Agency in London. In any case, Jack the Ripper was a serial murderer who murdered, depending again on who you believe um, or which theory you subscribe to, a minimum of five women. Although that's not necessarily true because not everyone even agrees on, on the five what are called canonical murders, meaning generally accepted by everyone. Um, some believe there were six, some believe seven, eight, nine, and so on. Um, I'm in the camp of 12, 13, possibly 14, and I have a way that I've linked them together, which has not been seen before or not been discovered before, but I can easily back up if we get a chance to talk about that today. But in any case, the Ripper would have murdered five women who up until probably two, three years ago, everyone generally accepted were prostitutes or what were referred to as unfortunates back then, Yeah, women who lived on the street and sold themselves for anything, you know, half a penny, a loaf of stale bread. They were so destitute that they would um, basically sell themselves for anything to, to survive and to help their families survive. They didn't, they weren't prostitutes by choice, if they were at all. Now, there's been this book that was written recently, which is purporting to blow the lid off that and say that they were just homeless women and not prostitutes. I, I do not subscribe to that theory. Um, because of the fact that many of them had records for prostitution and some were arrested multiple times for, for doing that. And the Ripper's MO was, and in fact, again, if you believe that he wrote some of the letters that were received by the police and by the central news agency, he claims to be down on whores, his wording, not mine. And, um, and so it tends to lend credence to the fact that they were actually women that were working on the street women work on the street today. I know that it's disparaging, but there are many women that work on the streets, not by their own choice, um, but by necessity or be because of drug habits or, or many other reasons. And they are often the victims of, of violence and murder. Yeah. So I believe that the Ripper did target prostitutes, although, as I said, it's not the popular belief these days to, to say that. Okay. Um Obviously, you've got some very interesting theories, and we'll get to those in a few minutes. Firstly, can I just get your general impression of how well you think the police handled this case overall? I think the police handled it about as well as was possible in 1888, given the lack of forensic science that we have today, given the, the lack of experience in terms of preserving evidence or crime scene technology that we have today. I think that Given what they had to work with, I think they did about the best job they, they could have done. Yeah. I think there was some lack of communication between the Metropolitan Police, the London City Police. There, there, 
the fact is that the Ripper murdered women in various areas of, of the East End, which on purpose or not, whether by design or not, um, actually fell into different jurisdictions of the police. And so there were different police officers in charge of some of the different cases. And they may or may not have shared information as well as we do today. Yeah. Um, partially by design, maybe there were some rivalry in solving the case. Maybe it's just, again, people don't understand that in 1888, there weren't cell phones or, or walkie talkies or, or means of communication with the computer. There wasn't an internet. You had to do everything by letter or you had to actually visit with each other. It wasn't the same as, as today where you could just call somebody or, or text it. Plus there was no CCTV, no DNA database. They had very few tools. Yeah. None of that. And so I think the police have been kind of given a, a little bit of a black eye when they didn't necessarily deserve it because the, the rippers, and I use that word plural, were very, very clever. The mastermind, in my opinion, of the ripper killings was one of the great thinkers of the 1800s, Prince Kropotkin, Peter Kropotkin, a Russian prince, founder of the anarchy movement. This man was extremely clever in terms of warfare, guerrilla type warfare in, in, in politics. And I think that they were assuming that this was a madman. In fact, they accused a few madmen of it, specifically um, Kosminski, Aaron Kosminski, who ended up in Colney Hatch Asylum as a madman. And he's a very popular suspect in the Ripper killings. But when you look closely at the killings, the motivation behind them, the dates that they were performed, um, you realize that a madman couldn't be behind it. It was an, actually a mastermind. Okay. And you've obviously done a lot of research and you've, you've written an entire book about this, which we'll mention later. How Can you give us an idea of how much time you spent on this and how you've gone, gone about collecting all the de data that you have? Well, I actually started looking into the case when I was a small boy. Um, I've always been interested in, in true crime. I, I used to read all my mom's true crime novels. You know, you may be too young to remember these, but there were these novels that you would get that would detail a case and you'd always flip to the middle of the book for the pictures, which you weren't supposed to do, but I would always look at the pictures first and it would be crime scene photos and pictures of the victim and, and some of the witnesses and some of the police involved. And um, I was always very intrigued with the Ripper case. So I've been interested in it and reading everything written on the case since, you know, for, for 40 plus years, 50 years almost. And, you know, some of the guys, I've, I've actually gotten to meet some of the guys that wrote some of that literature on the Ripper case uh, in the past few years, which, which has been a, an absolute honor. Uh, so I've been interested in that case for, for that long, but I set out really to crack it in 2012. That was when I really decided that my mission in life was going to be to crack this Ripper case right. because of the fact that I'd read everything written on the case up until that point, And I was never satisfied with anyone's explanation or anyone's analysis of the case. I was never fully satisfied that anyone had solved it. And even if someone had, they didn't have enough supporting evidence for my taste. So I said, I'm going to, I'm going to crack this thing. And I'm either going to go along with a popular theory that's out there now, or I'm going to come up with my own, which I ended up doing. Okay. And you've already alluded to it a little bit, but can you please expand on your theory? Um, am I right in understanding you think there's three individual perpetrators that were working yes. together? I believe, and a lot of people have thought that it was maybe different people copycatting or, or being blamed for a series. But in my opinion, and I can back this up with a lot of facts that I'm going to go through with you today. Sure. The Ripper killings were committed by three men working together who were members of what was called the International Working Men's Educational Club, which was actually a socialist anarchist club whose mission statement was to destroy England, to bring England to its knees. But it was covering itself as an educational club for Jewish men. That club was funded and was, was actually founded and funded by Prince Peter, Peter Kropotkin, who was um, a Russian prince who had actually been imprisoned in two different countries and expelled from four for arranging political assassinations. Um, he absolutely hated England, even though he held a home in England, in London. Yeah. And he founded the socialist clubs 
in more than one country. So I believe that Prince Kropotkin brought over a man called Louis Diemschutz and put him in charge of the International Working Men's Educational Club. Now that name Diemschutz, I researched, it's not actually a Russian surname. It actually is, is a word that means, it's a Yiddish German hybrid word that means protector of noble women, or it could also mean protector of smoke, as in made of smoke, smoke and mirrors. Yeah. At one point, Diemschutz listed his name as Diem Holtz, which means wood smoke. So I think it was a fake name he came in under. He was placed in charge of the International Working Men's Educational Club. And I believe he recruited from that club disgruntled Jewish men who were sick and tired of what was called the Jewish sweating system, which was a quasi slavery of the Jew in London. It was, a, it was sweatshops where they worked for slave wages and they were forced to live in squalor in the worst part of London, which was Whitechapel in the East End. Yeah. And I believe that Prince Kropotkin despised the sweating system. And I believe he despised Christianity. He actually writes that he does. Yeah. He writes that Christianity is the greatest enemy of his cause. And I believe that he despised prostitution, not prostitutes, prostitution as an institution. He, he despised the abuse of human beings, prostitute women, sometimes men or boys, he, he felt that was the most egregious abuse of a human being possible, worse than slavery in terms of working. Okay. So I believe that Prince Kropotkin devised a plan using Diemschutz and men recruited by Diemschutz to perform a series of killings in London that would draw a spotlight to not only the plight of the Jew, but to the plight of the prostitute in London. Because all of a sudden, people were all over the world were reading about what? prostitute slayings in London. I mean, you, you know, today we have the internet and all these distractions. But in the 1800s, if you picked up a newspaper and it said something about um, new houses of parliament being built or uh, some sort of a debate in, in, in parliament, or you picked and you, or you saw a prostitute dismembered in Whitechapel, well, that's the first thing that you're going to read. Yeah. Sex sells. And Kropotkin knew it. So I so believe... What do on. you think... Kapotkin's end goal was? I mean, I completely understand that he's got this hatred towards a lot of society and, and his perception of prostitution and the way that Jewish men, some of them were being treated, but what was he hoping to achieve? So apart from attention, what, what, how would it help his goal, do you think? I, I believe he did achieve a lot of what he set out to do. First of all, I believe he set out to create anarchy in the streets of London, which he did. Yeah. Um, the, the anarchist's code, which he writes about, um, quite extensively, is to ridicule the police, ridicule the government, uh, cause them problems wherever possible, make fools of them when possible, and by whatever means necessary, be it violence, be it, be it ridicule, in, in any way possible to be sort of a pebble in their shoe at, at all times. And I think that he did accomplish that. There were riots. There were socialist riots. In fact, my suspects were three of them arrested in a socialist riot. There were there was also reform that came from the Ripper killings because, as I said before, people were reading, what? You mean in, the, in, in London? Isn't that where Buckingham Palace is? You mean, you know, changing of the guard tea and crumpets, fountains, uh, polo games? You mean there's, there's famine? There's disease? There's, there's prostitution? There's murder? And so I, I believe that Queen Victoria was sort of, I don't know if I want to say forced, but she was prodded to sort of clean up to, to, to put more lights in the area, to, to give these women health care, to get them off the streets, yeah. to, to patrol and, and clean up the crime in the area, and to address the Jewish plight. And I think that Kropotkin, and as much as I hate to give them credit, I believe that Kropotkin and his crew actually accomplished a great deal of what they set out to do. Okay, wow, that's a very interesting theory. It's very bold as well. So you've you've mentioned that you've you've had some evidence, you've seen a lot of documentation that backs up your theories. So do you mind telling us a bit about it, please? Great. Sure. Well, first of all, if I backtrack and I talk about Kropotkin, we can look into his writings after the Ripper crimes, and we see that he does reference Jack the Ripper at least twice in two different writings in his anarchist um, morality essay and another essay that he wrote. And he loves 
the Ripper's motivation. What he says, and I'll paraphrase him, and then I can actually read it for you if you need me to. But he basically says, if we were ever to catch Jack the Ripper, we might think that he would deserve a bullet through the brain. But if we really were to look at the man and his motives and what he did and what he accomplished, we would realize that all of our hatred for Jack the Ripper would, would evaporate and all of our hate would go towards the government that, that basically caused the Jack the Ripper to arise and do what he did. We would put the bullet through the brain of the man who owned the wretched den in which the latest victim, Mary Jane Kelly, did business. That man, John McCarthy, is the one that deserves the bullet through the brain. And the judicial system that would hang Jack would actually be more murderous than all the rippers together, he said. So what's funny is, shortly after the Mary Jane Kelly murder, the man who owned the wretched den that she did business in, it was called Miller's Court. Um, there was a guy called John McCarthy who owned it. He received a threatening letter from Jack the Ripper. And in that letter, there's a little drawing at the bottom, a little, basically uh, uh, almost a cartoon, like a political cartoon, but roughly drawn. But what I did was I, through a, an animation you can see on my YouTube channel, I tore that drawing apart and within the figures, basically the drawing is one man stabbing a woman, another man watching, and a third man standing guard against the wall. And when you take those drawings individually, each one of them contains, is made up of the letters which it takes to write these men's names. For example, the figure that's stabbing the woman is made up of the letters that create Isaac M. Kozabrodsky, one of my suspects. The man in the middle who's sort of supervising and holding a knife is made up of the letters Louis Diemschutz. So name. sorry, when you say made up of the letters, do you mean the letters are physically drawn into the pictures? Yes. Themselves? Well, in other words, the body of the man is a D, an upside down D. His arm is a, is a Z, that is the Z in Diemschutz. And, if you, and what I did in an animation, if you look at my YouTube channel, you can yeah. see it. The, each figure, and it's not even between the three. The first figure is made up of the letters Isaac M. Kozabrodsky. Wow. The second figure is made up of the letters Louis Diemschutz. And the guy stood against the wall is made up of the letters Samuel Friedman. Right. So wow. it, it, it's a kind of a word game that he played. And that's not the only word game that they played. See, yeah. Kropotkin, again, used every possible opportunity to ridicule the police. And so he did these played these word games, whether it was Diemschutz or whether it was Kropotkin that played this word game remains to be seen. But in any case, it wasn't the only word game they played. They also left a graffito on the wall of one of their worst enemies that said the Jews are not the men that will be blamed for nothing, depending on whose remembrance of that graffito you, you want to go with because it was erased from the wall before they photographed it. But that was also, in my opinion, an anagram for that bent whore be the filth, not the Jew men, L.D., Isaac, nor Samuel. So it, it's, it's, uh, he loved word games, and he, he, even his name, Dean Schutz, was a word game, in my opinion, because it's not a real name, smoke and mirrors. So, um, but getting back to your, your original question about, um, about Kropotkin, uh, he actually, in his writings, ridicules the police, talks about how it's important to ridicule the police using violence or any other means at, at your disposal. And he praises Jack the Ripper. In another bit of his writing, he says, the Ripper murders um, stopped, not because of the police and their good work, but because the people of Whitechapel demanded it. Now, number one, how does he know exactly why the Ripper murders stopped? I mean, you can opine, but you know, being a ripper, I don't know, you called me an expert. I don't know if that, that's the right word for me, but an aficionado of the case, not the ripper. Um, one of the first things that people often ask me is, why did the killing stop? And Kropotkin offers his answer is, is that the, it wasn't because the police did a good job. To go back to your earlier question. Yeah. But it was because the people in Whitechapel demanded and needed that to stop. Okay. Okay, wow. This is blowing my mind. <laughs> um, so. so at the time, how much attention did Kapotkin get? How, were people reading his writings and were they... Were they no, those, those bits weren't written yet. 
But Kropotkin was a frequent speaker at the International Working Men's Educational Club, where Dean Schutz uh, was the steward. And by the way, where the second, or the, rather the first of the two double event murders took place in front of that club. They used it for propaganda. They reckoned that they wanted to bring the whole world's attention to their club. And they got a load of free press out of it. Yeah. And propaganda, as you know, is near and dear to the anarchist communist cause. I think they even created the word propaganda, propagating their theories and their, their beliefs. But in any case, there was a murder, the first of the two double event murders, their tour de force performance, if you will, took place in front of the International Working Men's Education Club. Now, Kropotkin frequently did speaking engagements there where he spoke against the British government and spoke for the, the working class and for the Jew. And the, the, the one of the the highlights of his speeches that I remember was after the last Ripper murder, he went there and said, uh, I need all of you Jewish men to return to Russia with me right away, not tomorrow, now, to go and fight, you know, the, the bourgeoisie of, of, of Russia as the proletariat. I need you to come with me and fight the good fight. And I believe that's why, that's how he managed to pull Diemschutz out of London. And I think he brought him back to, to Russia. And by the way, at that appearance that he made at the International Working Men's Educational Club, he brought with him his best buddy, who was a German or sorry, a Russian playwright by the name of Stepniak. Now, Stepniak um, was a convicted knife murderer. He had murdered the chief of the Russian secret police in public with a knife and had been exiled from Russia. So Kropotkin's running around with a convicted knife murderer, okay? Kropotkin, uh, Kropotkin and, and Stepniak did this speech that night. So he was a frequent visitor and speaker at the International Working Men's Educational Club. Okay. Wow. Okay. And something that really caught my attention that you mentioned earlier was this double event and also the fact that the Ripper or the Rippers were taunting the police for their communications. Can you tell us a little bit about what they were writing to the police, why you think they were writing and also about this double event, what they said would happen and what actually happened? Well, I believe that in the, the letter that is known as the Dear Boss letter, which a lot of people will, will say it wasn't the Ripper and some um, enterprising journalists took credit for having written it, but never proved to my satisfaction that he actually did do it. Um, I believe that in this Dear Boss letter and, and the, the Saucy Jackie postcard as well, besides taunting the police, I think that what they were doing was setting up this double event. They were letting the police know there's going to be a double killing. And they wanted the police to know that for, for in my belief, the main reason besides taunting the police, ridiculing the police, and bringing attention to the case, making it more sensational. I think that what they wanted to do was they wanted the police to be on the lookout for a double murder, so that when the first murder took place of the double event, I think that they wanted the police to think, oh, there's going to be another one. And why? Because Diemschutz was going to pretend to find the first body, and then the police, every policeman in, in London was going to flock to the International Working Men's Educational Club, propaganda for the club. And Dean Schutz was going to be sitting there with hypocritical grief, pretending to be shaken and, and, and afraid and uh, traumatized by the finding of this body. So while he was sitting there with the police, with all his attention upon him, his two uh, accomplices were going to run ostensibly for the police looking for a policeman, but actually to Mitre Square, 0.6 miles away and they were going to run there and they were going to commit a second murder to to sort of back up the fact that that letter was authentic and they were going to do that in front of his worst enemy synagogue chief rabbi adler who was the enemy of of the international working men's educational club they did the murder right across the street from adler's synagogue and they did it exactly a half an hour later why because they knew dean schutz knew that every cop in london was going to be at the International Working Men's Educational Club. He was going to have an airtight alibi. Every cop in London will be sitting with him while that second murder takes place half a mile away. So because he's not guilty of the second one, he couldn't be guilty of the first because the cops were expecting this double event yeah. by this letter that they were warned with. Yeah. So it was actually quite clever. 
because then these two characters, one of them runs home and dumps the knife a block from his house. And the other one runs back to the club and says, I couldn't find a cop. So, and he's 17 years old. They don't suspect this kid. Yeah. So they pull it off. And because he couldn't possibly be guilty of the second, he couldn't be guilty of the first. first. And yeah. then they, that morning, they send out another, the, the Saucy Jackie postcard that we just talked about. They send out this postcard, which again says, ha ha, I killed the two. I cut the girl's ear off to make sure that the cops, it solidified the, to the cops that it was the same guy that did both. So they would immediately discount Deem Schutz as a suspect because yeah. nobody thought the Ripper was more than one guy. And at that point, was Dean Schitz a suspect at that point? No, and he never was. He right. never was. He's just some dumb guy that found a body <laughs> in front of his educational club, which they had no idea was actually a, a socialist anarchist club whose mission statement was to destroy England at all right. costs. Right. They didn't know. And I don't know that they ever did. Yeah. Wow, that is really interesting. Um, so... Am I right in thinking that you've you've obviously told a lot of people about about this theory, and yeah. quite a few renowned criminologists are backing you up, aren't they? So can you tell us about how you got in touch with them and, and what they what your conversations were about? Right. Well, first of all, um, my co-authors in in this book, Sherlock Holmes and the Autumn of Terror, are Dr. Michael M. Baden, who um, your listeners would probably know very well and probably needs no introduction, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. He's a world famous forensic pathologist, formerly Manhattan, New York forensic pathologist. He took part in the autopsies for the Kennedy assassination, Elvis Presley, John Belushi, Klaus von Bülow. He was recently the hands up, don't shoot uh, uh, forensic pathologist who proved that, um, you know, the facts of that case. He also was the second uh, forensic pathologist to autopsy Epstein wow. and proved uh, for everyone's satisfaction what everyone already knew that Epstein didn't kill himself. Right? And so Michael Baden, uh, your, your listeners would have seen him uh, on the HBO show Autopsy, which he had for a while. And um, they would see him on Fox News if they watch that. He's called, you know, lovingly called Dr. Death, where he's a frequent contributor. So he is just, uh, you know, without parallel. Now, I met Dr. Baden uh, at a trial for a, a serial killer in my area. And Dr. Baden and I, through good fortune, were thrown together for a few hours with nothing to do. And um, I managed to convince Dr. Baden of my ripper evidence. Little did I know that Dr. Baden was actually paid in the 1960s by the British government to solve the ripper crimes wow. and was given access to everything they had, but he couldn't solve it at the time. But when I sat down with him, you know, I'll give you a little snippet of the conversation. So, Dr. B, if I was to tell you I solved the Ripper crimes, <laughs> Jack the Ripper crimes, what would you say? Well, Randy, from what I know of you, it just so happens that his brother's a, a, an a, a aficionado of the same style of martial arts that I practice. And he, the night before, I had called his brother with him and we talked a little bit about the style that I do. It's called Wing Chun Gong Fu. Yeah. And so Dr. Baden now knows that I'm somewhat accomplished in this martial art that his brother does. So he says to me, well, after what my brother says about you, you know, in most cases, I would just laugh you off. But, you know, we've got some time. Let me know who was Jack the Ripper. And I said, well, it's not that simple, Doc. It's actually three men being paid by a fourth. And he goes, well, all right. Now you've got my attention because I always felt that it was more than one man. Um, who was the main Ripper then, Randy? And I said, well, you know, Doc, it's going to be somebody you've never heard of. It's a guy called Louis Deemschutz. And he goes, Louis Deemschutz, Louis Deemschutz. Wasn't that the guy that found the body of Elizabeth Stride outside the International Working Men's Educational Club on the night of September 30th, 1888, the first <laughs> of the two double event murders? Yeah. And I go, um, yeah. And he goes, well, you're going to have a little bit of trouble convincing me, Randy, because he was actually with the police when... Catherine Eddowes was found murdered uh, in Mitre Square, 0.6 miles away. And I go, well, that's where the accomplices come in, Dr. Biden, because the two accomplices did that murder while he was there setting himself up with an alibi. Yeah. And then you saw the wheels turning and he goes, all right, let's hear it. <laughs> so I give him, in a nutshell, my case, a lot of what I just told you, plus a lot more. 
And he says, and he's going on, and he's going, yep, yep, yep. And he says, you do know, by the way, that I was saw, I was actually paid by the British government to solve this crime in the 60s, but I wasn't able to do it. He said, I did not know that, sir. And he goes, well, I, I said, I was wondering how you, how you knew who Dean Schutz was right away. So he listens to my whole case, and then he says to me, all right, listen. He goes, everything that you've told me so far tallies with what I know. But yeah. there's some things you're telling me that I don't know for a fact. Yeah. I want your case file on my desk tomorrow. Wow. And and if I can corroborate everything that you're telling me today, you've cracked it, son. <laughs> so no problem. My case was put together. I shipped it to him the next morning. And it was about two weeks. I didn't hear from him. And I thought, right, he's, he doesn't like my theory. Mm. And I'm sitting out by the uh, the pond with my, my dogs one day. And my cell phone rings. And it's Dr. Bodden. So, son... You've cracked it. You've got to get Cyril and Henry involved. So that would be Cyril H. Wecht, the former pathologist for Pittsburgh, who is a very famous uh, pathologist. You see him on TV all the time now. Your your viewers, listeners would know him. He also was involved in the Kennedy uh, autopsy. Elvis Presley, John Benet Ramsey, O.J. Simpson case, Dr. Jeffrey McDonald case, the Waco, Texas Branch Davidian fire case, um, Vince Foster, the aid to the Clintons who committed suicide by shooting himself in the back of the head three times. Right. So, you know, Dr. Weck and you see him, he's a talking head on forensic files and 48 hours and everything else. So, and Dr. Henry C. Lee, who like me is a Kung Fu guy, and, but he's a lot better than me. He was a world, he was a, a champion in Taiwan when he was a kid in like a, basically like a death match type of uh, tournament, you know, and he was the top guy. So Dr. Lee, um, you, you would have known him from Trace Evidence TV show on Court TV years ago. He's been involved in like 9,000 criminal cases, and I'm not exaggerating, including O.J. Simpson case. He's the guy that stood up and said, there's something wrong here with the blood evidence. John Benet Ramsey, Phil Spector. Um, and he's basically, in my opinion, single-handedly responsible for the recovery alive of Elizabeth Smart because he figured out who abducted her and was able to tell the police who to look for. And they found her based on what on his conclusions. Yeah. So for my money, you know, he's responsible for her being alive today. And in fact, she still corresponds with him. And, you know, when she got married, she invited him. She's constantly updating him on her life. And she absolutely credits him for her being alive today. Sure. Those are my three co-authors. And the other the last two, Dr. Lee and Dr. Weck, um, got involved only because Dr. Bodden said to them, listen, this guy's cracked it. We need to do something together. Okay. Well, that's a really inspiring story that you managed to get all these people, such hope, high profile, credible, respected people. Yeah. And I'll say this, I don't want to mention any names because I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but I will say this, when we all sat down to discuss the writing of the book and how we were going to do it and, and ending, ending up being a Sherlock Holmes novel rather than a, a dry true crime account, um, I found out on that at that meeting that all three of them had been offered a very generous sum of money by another very well-known Ripper theorist who wanted to pay them to basically rubber stamp that author's theory on the Ripper case. Yeah. But none of them were willing to put their reputations on the line for any amount of money. Well, I probably shouldn't say this, but they all three have more money than God. They don't need money. <laughs> But they weren't willing to put their reputations on the line for a theory that they didn't believe in. In yeah. my case, all three participated without me paying them a dime. Okay. And, you know, their time is money. And they've given a lot of time to this book and yet never charged me anything. What they did charge me was not money. But each one of them asked me, once we decided we were going to do it as a Sherlock Holmes novel, each one of them asked me to create a character that assists Holmes in the investigation based upon them. Right. So I have Dr. Rather than Dr. Baden, Michael Baden, I have Dr. Uh, Michael Braden and I have Dr. Cyril West and Dr. Henry Liu. And those three guys take part in, in my book, helping Sherlock Holmes solve the case. And in fact, Dr. Lee said, well, I have another demand. And I thought, oh, here comes the money part. And he goes, my character has to save Sherlock Holmes's life. <laughs> so I said, yeah, we can do that. So in my book, there's a, a portion of the book where 
There's a chapter where Sherlock Holmes goes undercover uh, at, a, at the Canary Wharf and uh, he ends up in a fight and the Dr. Henry Lee, Liu character, comes to his rescue and saves his life against a <laughs> band of Chinese uh, hatchet men. <laughs> wow, that sounds really interesting. So had you written uh, fiction before? No, this is my first. Uh, I mean, I did a screenplay years ago that for a, a martial arts movie that never really went anywhere. So this was really my first venture into fiction. I've written a, a bunch of books on the martial arts, but they're very dry, you know, accounts of, of, of the art and, and they're instructional, basically. So this is my first time. So I had to go in and reread re all of the home stories, all of the Doyle novels to kind of capture his his style of writing, you know, his, his phrasing, his pacing, you know, back then they used phrases, some of them that we, we wouldn't understand today, especially Americans. And some of them um, that we would have thought were new phrases that actually weren't. For yeah. example, they used to say, what's up, which I thought was kind of like a invented by that beer commercial, you know, what's up, what's up? Yeah. but actually it's, it, it's an old phrase from London um, yeah. in the 1800s. And they used to say, you know, smash and grab robbery, which I thought would have been a kind of 70s cop slang, but it's not. And But yet there were other phrases that he would use in his in his stories that I tried to reuse in mine. For example, he would say like, a facer. Well, an American guy wouldn't know what a facer is, and maybe some Brits wouldn't. But in context, we realized he dropped him with a facer with his left hand that left him bleeding on the sidewalk. So you know, a facer then is a punch to the face. Yeah. And, and another uh, another one that we Americans wouldn't know is the word trap. Now we think of a trap like a mouse trap. Yeah. But back then a trap was um, a taxi or a, a horse driven carriage. And so Americans would not know what a trap was. So I had to do all this research basically into old English speak and, and even some cockney rhyming slang, <laughs> which I always loved you know, since my first trip to England, but I really delved into it, you know, because in my book, she says, you know, take a look through his Lucy lockets, pockets, you know, he's run off down the frog and toad road. And uh, so I use that in my novel as well. Anything else you want to say about your book to entice, uh, entice my viewers? I would readers? love your viewers to take a look at my book, Sherlock Holmes in the Autumn of Terror. It has its own Facebook page. Um, if you look for it there. Um, I would like your, your viewers to take a look for it. It's available on Amazon. Um, it's in Kindle, paperback and hardback. But I also, during the pandemic, recorded it chapter by chapter and featured it on my Facebook page, one chapter a day, with a bunch of pictures that the listener can click on as they listen that support the story. So there'll be crime scene photos, maps, newspaper articles, drawings of Sherlock Holmes, and you can listen to, to me reading the book. So you can either uh, go to that page and you could search the page for chapter one, chapter two, or, or the word recap. Because if you search for the word recap, you'll find the couple of posts where I recap the whole book chapter by chapter. So it sounds like it, an immersive experience, not just a book. Well, that's kind of what I was intending. So you can do it that way. Now, the bad part is you have to listen to me reading Holmes and Watson <laughs> in my horrible English. Well, it's not an English accent. I read it in my own accent. And I did get some friends where it was absolutely necessary for the Cockney rhyming slang and stuff like that. I got British friends of mine to read certain portions of the book. <laughs> and I got a British friend of mine who's good with the media to do me a really neat intro with music and a British guy saying, you know, Sherlock Holmes in the Autumn of Terror written by Randy Williams with Dr. Michael Bodden, Dr. Cheryl Weck and Dr. Henry Lee. Yeah. And, and then, but you know, I read it in my own accent. The only sort of tip of the hat to, to an accent that I do is when I read from the Ripper's perspective, because in the book, I, I do the murders twice. At the beginning of the book, I do the murders from the standpoint that you don't know who it is. And I drop clues. And if you're very astute in your reading, you'll go like, well, how could he do that and that at the same time? That doesn't sound like one guy could do that. But that's left for you that's to figure point. out. Yeah. But later in the book, I do the murders again from the Ripper's perspective where they're talking. And when I do that, I did something that I kind of, I think I borrowed it from a movie in the 1960s or something where I start the, the chapter in, in the foreign accent, like a pseudo Russian or Polish accent. And then I slip into my own accent. For example, it'll be like, 
it was a rainy, dark night in London. Then I did, and then I go into my own accent, and then I finish the chapter in that fake accent again. But the, I don't do, I don't torture the listener, you know, with the whole chapter. But I just kind of wanted to set the pace that it was a Russian guy saying this or a Polish guy saying this. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Just like you get comfortable with your pipe. So, oh yeah, I got to do that. <laughs> You're really embracing the image of Sherlock Holmes, I see. Well, here, here's what happened, Doc. I, when I, I as I told you before, I kind of immersed myself in the in this whole Doyle vibe when I went to write this book. Yeah. And what I did was for that whole period that I wrote the book, I didn't listen to modern music. I listened to only music that was available in the 1800s, Mozart, um, Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky particularly because I believe, well, I know he was a favorite of Kropotkin. Yeah. And I listened to a lot of this, the classical music. I read only 1800s London literature. Um, I read 1800s London Punch newspaper. Uh, it was kind of, Punch was kind of like the Time magazine of London back then. And I read all the, the Punch articles from back then. And I kind of immersed myself. So, as long as you didn't take heroin. Sherlock Holmes was a heroin user, right? Well, it was cocaine, but no comment. I was a cocaine. And, and so, 7% solution. But, um, but what I did do, though, was I noticed that as I read all these Holmes stories and I read these other Doyle novels and he wrote ghost stories, medical horror stories, which are awesome. And, but every one of these stories has features the pipe prominently, whether it's, you know, I, I was stum- I was lost in the woods in a snowstorm and I stumbled upon this creepy cottage in the middle of the woods. And I knocked on the door and this hunchback answered, you know, would you care to come in? You know, and he offered me a pipe. Or whether it's, you know, Holmes and company sitting in front of a fire, smoking and, and theorizing. But in every Doyle novel and, and story, there's the pipe. Yeah. So I, had, I was sitting here in this very office I was writing, a snowy night. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, one of my dear friends who's since passed away, Chris Short, very dear friend of mine from, from England, had given me, knowing that I was a Sherlock Holmes fan, had given me this fabulous 1800s calabash sherlock holmes pipe and he i think i have it here um somewhere but he gave me this fabulous pipe and he gave me some tobacco for it and it was still in in a drawer hermetically sealed you know it, it was a couple of years old but it was still sealed so said, you know what i'm gonna bring this out and just see what i think of it so i bring it out load this pipe i didn't even know how to smoke a pipe and i <laughs> did like that and I went, you know, I like this. And, you know, I left it for a while and I picked it up again. And, you know, it's, so it's still, it's, it's one of my few vices anymore. I, I used to have more, but um, I, I enjoy it. It's relaxing. And I, I like the vibe, you know. It definitely has this the gentlemanly kind of feel about it. Yeah. Well, you know, what's cool about it too, Doc? Uh, you know, I work in a prison and sometimes, you know, I take a break and I go outside and I smoke my pipe. Or, or I may be somewhere in public and I go out and I'm smoking a pipe outside and complete strangers or friends at the jail will come up to me and they'll be like, and they'll say, you know what? That reminds me of my grandpa. He used to sit us down and then I'd get this beautiful story, sometimes from complete strangers about this person in their life that they love so much. Yeah. And, and they'll tell me this story. And they'll share this heartfelt story with me just because I'm out there smoking a pipe, you know? And it's so it's really cool. It's a really cool thing. And I can't wait to get back over to London with you because there's this pipe shop in Covent Garden that has the best tobacco and the yeah. coolest pipes ever, you know, <laughs> upstairs. Um, and, it, it, you know, I got to get back there. So just changing subjects a little bit, there's something that you said before <clears throat> and it had an, I put an, a thought of a question into my head, which is this. Obviously, you've managed to get a lot of people on sides with your theories about the Ripper. I imagine that you must have told some people who just thought that what you were talking about was crazy. So have you experienced that? Have you experienced oh, people that well, the Ripper completely community. rejected your theories? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. The Ripper community is what, what we call ourselves. I mean, I don't. I guess I do. But I didn't invent the term. They're called Ripperologists. It's yeah. a kind of a cottage industry almost. People that are interested in the Ripper case are known as Ripperologists. And everybody has their pet theory, you know, and they are sticking to it. 
So they guard that theory jealously. And anybody that clashes with their theory is automatically an enemy. You know, rather than, you know, a, a person that has a differing opinion, they're automatically your enemy. So you're immediately the subject of ridicule and scorn when you propose any theory that opposes theirs. Yeah. But I've actually spoken to a couple of the top ripperologists in the world, and that would be um, Richard Jones and Donald Rumbelow. And both of those guys, they're very diplomatic. They, they do not you know, endorse any theory or, or condemn. Well, they condemn a couple of them, but they, they basically are very diplomatic. They've both been very receptive to me. And Richard Jones is pretty much single-handedly responsible for getting my theory onto the world stage because he's so world-renowned. He's the one that introduced my theory and got me on the cover of Ripperologist magazine, <laughs> you know, a few years back. And, you know, I visited him in London. Uh, I think it was two years ago today I was with him and Donald Rumbelow. Two years ago tomorrow I was with him. And those guys um, are, I, I would venture to say they, they don't ridicule me. Um, you know, I don't want to, I, I can't speak for them. You'd have to talk to them and see what they think of my theory in private versus yeah. what they tell me. <laughs> but um, the, they're the ones that matter to me. You know, um, the ones that would, would spew hate on me because I, I don't agree with them on who the Rippers were or Ripper was, um, they're entitled to that. You know, I don't spew hate on anyone. I will say this, the person that put forth the theory that Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes, was Jack the Ripper, that's a man I'd like to punch in the nose. <laughs> because Doyle was such a a great man and such an inspiration and such a, a contribution, a contributor to the human race, that to to blame him for a series of heinous crimes like this yeah. is, is to me sacrilege and 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 is inexcusable. Yeah. You know, there there's others that say it was Lewis Carroll. Okay, well, if you think it was Lewis Carroll, oh, come on. <laughs> but but um, the only one that I really have scorn for and disdain for is the person that would purport that it was Arthur Conan Doyle Conan committing Doyle. crimes. Okay. Is there anything else you want to you want to say about either your book or about the Jack the Ripper case that we haven't mentioned that you think's important? To close Can this I chapter. A bit about my main suspect, Louis Deemschutz, besides the fact that his name is fake. Absolutely. Louis Deemschutz, along with Isaac Kozabrotsky, 17 year old at the time, and Samuel Friedman, a 42 year old at the time, um, were also subsequently arrested for a socialist riot, which had some amazing connections to the double event, which no one but me has ever brought forth. Deem Schutz was the steward of the club, as I mentioned before. Yeah. He lists in his arrest papers the first time when he was talked to by the police after the finding, quote unquote, of the body. He says, I'm a, a costume jeweler and uh, I, I sell costume jewelry. Now, two of the victims, Martha Tabram and Annie Chapman, were both resellers of costume jewelry. Martha Tabram, who was killed in George Yard stables where Deemschutz admits to the police he keeps his horse and buggy and claims to return between one and two in the morning from the market. Martha Tabern was killed between one and two in the morning in George Yard stables. Okay. Her, her husband, common law husband, had given her his paycheck two days prior to buy costume jewelry to resell so that she could stop selling herself. Yeah. Now, Deemschutz, later, when he's arrested in the socialist riot, claims to be a horseshoer, no more a costume jeweler. Well, one of the witnesses in the Ripper case um, claims that Jack the Ripper was wearing a huge, thick gold chain with a red jewel on it dangling and a horseshoe tie pin. Wow. Well, costume jewelry was not a common thing to be worn in the East End of London. And it couldn't have been real because no such jewel exists. And a gold chain like that would get you killed walking through the streets of London. Yeah. Also, in Dean Schutz's account to the police, he says, I was... I was coming home from work at exactly 1 a.m., which can't be true because the, the, the police arrived at five minutes to one. But he says, I know it was exactly one because I saw the clock in the bakery around the corner from my, my shop. So we're coming home in the pitch black and my horse shies and he won't go through the gate. So I stop, I jump down, I get my whip and I prod and I, ooh, it feels like a woman's body. Well, first of all, you know, I raise horses. 
Yeah. Horses' sense of smell isn't much better than ours. And it was pitch black and the horse was blinded. I know this because every drawing of, of Diemschutz that he posed for the next day, by the way, in any case, he says, he tells the police his horse shies. So the only way the horse would have shied, it's pitch black and he's blinded. And the body is off against the wall, not in the way of the horse. Yeah. So it would have been by smell. Now, this is a horse that goes to market at West O'Hill Hill Crystal Palace every day, where they sell cat meat, horse meat, his own kind. Yeah. And, and the and Whitechapel was, was a very stinky place at that time. So Diemschutz is trying to make me believe that this horse would have stopped because of this smell yeah. and not gone any further. So he jumps down and he checks the body, which he later says to somebody else, I thought it was my wife, maybe. But then later he tells the police, well, I didn't want to raise the alarm because my wife is a very delicate constitution and I didn't want her to panic. Yeah. He says the horse stops. So you can't have it both ways, Dean Schultz, because as an owner of horses, I don't believe for a minute that a horse would shy because of that. Yeah. But if, okay, we'll, we'll say that the horse did. So if the horse shied, I also know that a horse isn't going to stand there calmly for a half an hour while you run inside, raise the alarm, tell everybody to come out and check this body. The horse is going to bolt. Yeah. If a horse is, is panicked by something, it doesn't stand there nice while you jump down and check. Yeah. So I fully, I call it the phony pony story, <laughs> you know? So I want to say that about Dean Schitt's. And there's so much more for your listeners, viewers to, to see if they go to, to my page and go to the notes section, look at my evidence or go to that YouTube video that I did on Kropotkin yeah. and, and the, the coded message that was in that letter that I talked about. So I really want them to see that um, before just outright you know, saying that I'm wrong and, and discounting my theory. And there's a whole other thing that you probably don't have time or desire to get into, but the dates that the murders were committed, um, that were all a certain very specific series of dates in, in Russian, um, in the Russian view of the Bible. I want your viewers to look at that and look at the dates and look at why I think what I think and what I've uncovered to prove what I think. I hope they'll at least come at me with an open mind. And then if they want to shoot me down, I want them to say, Dean Schutz never said that. I want them to say, the witness didn't say that. I want them to say that murder didn't happen on that date. It sounds like there's so many complicated strands and you've tied at least several of them together. And we'll make sure that we put the links to, uh, to your Facebook page and your YouTube video at the end of this video as well. Well, look, you convinced me, Randy, and the, you've got a really interesting call to action. So to all my viewers, I think you should definitely check out all of Randy's material that he's been talking about. The links will be below. Let us know what you think. I think this is going to generate a fascinating conversation in the comment section. Randy, it was a pleasure to meet you. You're such a fascinating, charming and quirky character. Take care of yourself and thank you for being a guest on A Psych for Sore Minds. Cheers, Doc. It's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. Goodbye.